Okay, so yeah, in module seven, uh, we're going to be talking about single cell RNA sequencing. I've been following some of the discussion on the Slack about the single cell DNA as well. Uh, so some of those lessons are also going to come into play here. Um, so if anything is unclear, especially this bridge between the world of DNA and RNA, this is the this upfront section is probably the best place to uh, cover that all off. Uh, it's all Creative Commons, of course. So Francis has really highlighted how important this part is. Um, so everything here is either published or on a website somewhere. Um, so certainly share and share like. Um, these slides are free for you to use. Uh, yeah, so module seven. So my name is Trevor Pugh. I'm a senior scientist at Princess Margaret and I'm the director of genomics at OICR. And I'm sharing this time with uh, Javier Diaz. Um, and Javier, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Trevor. I will open my video in a, in a minute. But uh, yeah, my name is uh, Javier Diaz. Uh, I work with Trevor as a scientific associate for about three years at UHN, Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And starting in March this year, I joined a startup called Phenomic AI. Uh, we do uh, cancer analysis using machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I'm the head of data science there. I also highlight Javier also is the organizer of the Toronto single cell uh, RNA single cell RNA, single cell working group, uh, which I'll plug at the end. Um, I think some of you are already members. Um, but happy to continue interactions with this group um, through that, uh, that working group as well. Uh, so the goals for this afternoon are to know the difference between bulk and single cell sequencing. Uh, seems obvious, but there are a lot of little technical caveats, uh, especially in the upfront pre-sequencing step uh, that are really quite fundamentally different. Uh, I'm going to talk very largely about uh, how is single cell sequencing is being applied specifically to cancer samples and how that's different from how uh, work in non-cancer cells uh, is done. Uh, a ton of caveats, just like in RNA sequencing, again, following the Slack conversation, there's just a lot of nuance around how do you generate your data. All those caveats apply here to single cell as well. Uh, and probably the most exciting part of this is really a hands-on work with real published data. And most of the figures towards the end of my talk, uh, Javier will essentially teach you how to make uh, on your own. So I'm going to talk the first two pieces. Um, what are the technologies? And then we're, I'm going to use the glioblastoma stem cell data set that we recently published as an example of all the things that you can pull out and derive from single cell RNA sequencing data. Uh, and then picking up that exact same data set, uh, Javier will take you through what a single cell analysis would look like, uh, right from reads all the way through to, uh, to data sharing. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, technologies to start. Um, so there's so many now cliched ways to communicate single cell sequencing and how it uh, compares to bulk. This is my version, uh, really thinking of tumors. I'm going to be careful with the language here. The tumors being a collection of all cells that make up a mass, an oncogenic mass. And those tumors contain a diversity of cancer cells, immune cells, and other cell types. And I put a multiple myeloma bone marrow up next to a bowl of M&Ms because it conceptually is kind of the same. What defines a blue M&M? What defines a cancer cell? What defines a infiltrating vascular um, vessel or T cell? Um, so, and the challenges are really the same. If you're really interested only in blue M&Ms or blue Smarties, how do you go through and pick out those cells specifically? We really couldn't do that with bulk sequencing. The old approach would just be grab a handful of M&Ms and eat them or analyze them. Now we don't have to do that. You can literally pick through the bowl and ask different questions of different types of cells. Uh, and this is the formal way to show that. Uh, so single cell transcriptomes really let you see heterogeneity that you can't, couldn't have seen using bulk sequencing. Um, so the bulk approach is essentially you take these six cells, you grind them up and you get an average. So there's six green dots, you get a square of six. Now we get a different gene expression level for literally every single cell. Uh, but there are a lot of technical caveats with, uh, with that increased resolution. Uh, most specifically, our ability to fully read out all genes being expressed by a single cell. With that specific uh, topic, we'll go into a little more detail. 
Uh, but before we get there, I really wanted to go through the generic approach to single cell sequencing. Uh, if you try to keep up with the single cell literature, you'll rapidly become overwhelmed by the huge number of ways to process a sample. So digest the tissue, do you use flow cytometry? Are you working with a mouse? Um, there are lots of ways to get single cells floating in a tube. Uh, I'm not going to belabor that point, but there are really lots of ways to get to a single cell suspension. Uh, once you get there, uh, the goal is to really individually barcode each of your pieces of RNA for each cell. And there are lots of ways to do that. We're going to be talking a lot about the 10X Genomics platform, um, but certainly there have been uh, very manual ways using flow cytometry, putting each cell in an individual well. 10x genomics, you basically pull each cell into an oil droplet. Uh, the ways to do this with antibodies now. Um, so this molecular barcoding technique probably doesn't have as many approaches as tissue digestion, but there are still lots of ways to barcode a RNA and assign it to a cell. And probably more generic at the end is sequencing. So this is still the common currency. Uh, Illumina really has a dominant position in the sequencing market. Uh, so a lot of the data that will actually come out, certainly in terms of fast cues, really do look the same. And there aren't really that many different approaches to sequence DNA, align it. Uh, and there is a bit of debate around how to normalize a cluster. And it's particularly challenging in, uh, in cancer samples. And we'll go through that, uh, that in more detail as well. Uh, but this in general uh, is sort of a generic approach to a single cell sequencing experiment. And especially as bioinformatics anal an analysts, really understanding, which is, I'd say is sort of down here in the third box, it's extremely important to understand how the up, the two upfront uh, processes were done, because it will really totally change how you approach single cell data. Uh, and this paper is basically a review of all the ways that you can isolate those single cells. Um, so the very early days of single cell sequencing, it was literally a pipetter and a single cell suspension. Um, you would basically just pipette each cell one by one into a well and do what's essentially a bulk RNA sequencing reaction in a single well on a single cell. Uh, other approaches, um, FACS is probably the other approach rather than using a pipetter, using a, a, a essentially a flow sorter to pull out and assign uh, cells to individual wells. Uh, laser capture microdissection, I actually did this a lot as a graduate student, literally a laser to cut around a cell of interest and you pull it out. Um, more conventionally, this is how the 10x genomics pl platform really works. Essentially, you digest your uh, tissue, um, you, yeah, you digest your uh, tissue into a single cell suspension, and then that is loaded into a microfluidic uh, device. Uh, in this case, uh, this works essentially because you can deliver your single cell suspension into an oil droplet, and that oil droplet has the reagents you need. So it's conceptually very similar to a plate, but you can do this in much higher uh, throughput. Uh, and there are extremely fancy ways to pull, uh, specifically panel F is talking about looking at circulating tumor cells. Uh, so essentially using antibodies or other ways to capture cells to lift those cells out of suspension. Um, suffice to say, this is probably the most, um, this step here is probably the step that will influence your data the most downstream. And it's very important to control a lot of the parameters around how exactly you're isolating and pulling out your single cells. Once you have your single cells, uh, there's lots of ways to, uh, to uh, generate uh, RNA sequencing libraries. I put this title in quotes. This is literally the title of the uh, paper cited at the bottom of the slide. And just like uh, the DNA sequencing capacity, you can really just see the huge increase in the number of cells that can now be uh, profiled in a single experiment. Uh, and this has just continued to grow um, since this paper in uh, 2018. Uh, and lots of different ways to get there. Uh, at the end of the day, the concept is really the same. It's um, essentially an RNA profile of a single cell, profiled to varying levels of depth in terms of transcripts per cell, but also breadth in terms of coverage across a, a full RNA transcript. Uh, the two dominant technologies currently for uh, generating single cell uh, sequencing data are the 10X Genomics Chromium um, system, which is um, essentially profiling end reads of your RNA, uh, either from the three prime end or the five prime end. Uh, and the earlier technology, but still very, very widely used uh, SmartSeq2 technology. And I did wanna go through these in a little bit uh, more detail. This paper goes into even more detail than this, uh, but I did wanna hammer home the effect of using these two different approaches on what your data will look like when it uh, comes out of the, uh, out of the sequencer. 
the big difference here specifically is this poly A priming. And actually, both technologies will use this poly A prime. So that's already caveat number one. If you're really interested in transcripts that don't get poly A primed, uh, circularization, circular RNAs, don't go looking for them because they're very unlikely to be found if your transcript is not polyadenylated. Uh, and the drop seek method, you essentially prime off that A. Um, you, it amplifies a relatively, what was previously thought to be a relatively short distance. It actually turns out to be quite a bit uh, longer than previously thought. Uh, you then amplify those transcripts by PCR. And then there's this tagmentation approach, which essentially randomly uh, inserts into the transcript and results in a little tiny short tag here at the end. A uh, very similar approach here to SmartSeq2. The big difference here with SmartSeq2 is you actually read to the end of the transcript. And then there's this uh, little step at the end called template switching. So when you get to the end of the transcript, the enzyme just starts parking in Cs and essentially add your, uh, your barcode in at this, uh, at this point. Uh, and then basically it's the exact same idea. This tagmentation approach delivers um, these uh, sequencing adapters randomly throughout the entire transcript. Uh, and the huge benefit of SmartSeq2 is now you're actually getting full end-to-end uh, -end reading of, your, of the entire transcript. Whereas the uh, 10x genomics approach really is just giving you this little short tag, uh, sufficient for gene expression, but not gonna let you get any of the other uh, exon usage or uh, potential splice isoforms, uh, fusion transcripts that you would get from what we're used to from bulk RNA sequencing. Uh, as a result, there's also a huge cost difference. So smart C2 is extremely expensive because you have to pay to sequence across the whole transcript. 10x genomics, you're just sequencing at the very end. So your cost per cell is much lower. And you can almost tell just by reading the abstract which technology they used. So a lot of smart C2 papers are in the hundreds and 10x genomics papers are usually in the thousands, now often tens or even hundreds of thousands uh, of, of cells being profiled. Uh, and this is really the effect on this data. Even if they, no one told you what the uh, what technology it was, you could tell just by looking at the coverage of uh, of, of reads across the entire whoop, across the transcript. Uh, so here's what SmartSeq2 data looks like. So here's a generic transcript. This is a little three exon gene. And in SmartSeq, you see great coverage across an exon, nothing in the intron. Great coverage across another exon, nothing in the intron. It looks like bulk RNA sequencing data, but it's at the single cell level. Uh, contrast that to the 10x chromium, you get this huge spike, right, the three prime end, and essentially no coverage. Uh, but it actually turns out there are, since you are poly A priming, if there is a little stretch of A's, those little regions do get amplified as well. So depending on your bioinformatics pipeline, um, you will only look at this region. Uh, although increasingly we're starting to use this off, um, off poly A priming as an approach to start to call mutations deeper into the transcript. Because that data are there, it's just whether your pipeline is actually utilizing that information. Uh, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, in general, you're just able to financially afford way more cells using 10x chromium because you're just sequencing this little end. Uh, whereas with the SmartSeq2 approach, um, you basically have to pay for the sequencing reads that are mapping to all these exons. So in general, you're sequencing uh, fewer cells but you are getting a, a deeper profile. So in this example here, on average, oh geez, um, on average, you're getting uh, sort of north of 7,500 cells, whereas in the chromium approach, there is this uh, issue of transcript dropout where you're actually seeing 4,000 or even fewer uh, cells being, ex or genes being expressed uh, per cell. Hi, Trevor, question. Uh, Hi, yeah. Yep. So why do you see that plateauing effect when you're using the chromium? It's not 100% understood. It is thought to be molecular dropout during the amplification within a droplet. So essentially you deliver the cell, you then lyse the cell and all the barcodes get delivered to it. And then there is some loss here due to this tagmentation effect because you're only capturing the transcripts that happen to be sampled here. So it's essentially a, I don't want to call it an artifact, but it's like a function of how the RNA is prepared in the, uh, in the, in the lab. I see. Javier, okay. do you have a comment on that? I yeah, um, they have been improving since the first version. They are in version four of the kits now, I think the experimental kits, and they've been increasing the number of genes and number of reads that can come from each individual cell. But yeah, it's basically a physical limitation of how much reaction can happen within the droplet. And the amount of material that you have for the PCR there is not that you have um, two 
to do the reaction. You only have a small volume to do all the reactions, but they've been increasing it. This is also a similar concept is also challenged with the single cell DNA sequencing, because if you have two, two copies or two alleles, you lose one, you're never getting it back. It's literally the only copy. So same idea in RNA, if you're expressing a gene at a very low level and you just happen to not amplify it, it's gone for good. Uh, where the benefit of RNA is the highly expressed transcripts, at least there's multiple copies. So you're very likely to see them even if you have some attrition. So did that fully answer your question? Did you have any follow-up to that? No, that answered it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, please break in with questions like that. That's actually a great point. Um, so we've sort of talked about single cell, um, single cell isolation. We've talked about how to um, how the RNA is actually amplified and how data is made. Uh, I did want to have a generic slide really on bioinformatic tools in general. So this is actually reviewed relatively recently uh, in this paper here. Uh, really trying to address some of the issues that do come through in single cell RNA sequencing data. Uh, there's two major factors. Technical variation is by far the big one. We spend a lot of time uh, really as a field measuring, quantifying, and correcting for batch effects. Uh, different cells are captured to different uh, efficiencies, uh, even trickier depending on doing single cell or single nuclei sequencing. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about nuclei sequencing, uh, but essentially you're freezing the sample. The variant will come out of freeze at different viabilities. You'll actually get bias just from the act of freezing a cell. Uh, amplification bias, very similar to regular RNA sequencing, uh, sequence bias. And of course, we have biological variation as well. Um, so just like having technical replicates in RNA sequencing, you look at a thousand T cells, there's going to be some natural variation around that. Uh, I alluded the, to this also on the Slack channel, this concept of primary, secondary, and tertiary analysis. The same concept really holds here to single cell sequencing as well. There's the generation of data, which I largely just talked about that going through either SmartSeq2 or 10X Genomics and into the sequencer. By far, the most important is uh, QCing your data. Uh, do you have the expected transcripts, a uh, number of transcripts per cell? Um, do your cells classify as the cells that you thought you were putting into the experiment? Uh, we're going to talk about copy number variation. Are there copy number variants in the, what you suspect are the malignant cells? Um, do you have to throw out a sample? You're just not getting enough reads, or um, do you need additional reads to fully saturate a sample? The, really don't under spend a lot of time on the secondary analysis. It certainly saves you a lot of pain. When it comes to what I find is kind of the fun part, which is that tertiary analysis. How do you derive biological meaning from a well-normalized, well-formatted and structured data set? And, and to me, these are really three separate examples. And at least in my lab, we've moved more towards this exact model when we talk to both our collaborators, but also sequencing cores. Uh, the core will get you through primary, they'll even get you to secondary analysis, but we'll take it to tertiary analysis. Do you need a full uh, support all the way through this entire process, or do you just want the reads? Uh, and using phraseology like this and linking it to specific papers, just make sure that everyone understands who's doing what uh, and where and when. Uh, and this is also the tertiary part is really where this computational creativity, uh, really defining a strong biological question are absolutely the number one thing to do with single cell sequencing. Certainly in the early days, it was very tempting to download every package and attempt to run it. Um, it's sort of fun from a technical perspective, um, but it really doesn't get you very far uh, scientifically. Uh, so as we go into the um, both the background to the glioblastoma project, uh, but also into the workshop, it's very important to know exactly at what's, uh, what question you're trying to answer at each step in the analysis. And we have projects that are working in both of the in all three of these spaces. What are the cells that uh, reside in a tumor? How do they change over time? In a purified cell population, how are those regulatory networks changing between two states? We're very interested in pretreatment, post-treatment, uh, and how do cells develop both cancer cells but also immune cells that infiltrate tumors? Uh, but really building a specific question around each of these analysis, rather than the approach of just grinding through and running every algorithm that could possibly mention single cell sequencing especially when it comes to cancer genome analysis. 
Uh, and I'd certainly caution the group, a lot of tools, especially these trajectory tools, are really being built and driven by developmental biologists, assuming two copies of every chromosome and well-behaved regulatory networks. Uh, cancers are absolutely not that. They're aneuploid. You have lots of different copies of the chromosome. Sometimes you're missing chromosomes. And all of these have effects on uh, underlying distribution of gene expression patterns. Um, so really sort of treading carefully uh, applying tools that are built for developmental biology. They will almost certainly give you an output um, in terms of uh, bioinformatics tool functioning, uh, but it won't necessarily reflect the underlying biology of a, um, of a cancer sample with an unusual karyotype. Uh, so I'll pause it there. That's sort of the introduction to technology. So are there any questions at this point before we dive in specifically to the brain cancer example? Okay, so yeah, these concepts, concepts can be a little abstract without a, a sort of a solid set of questions or a solid data set. And that's really why Heavy and I thought we'd focus specifically on uh, recent publications, specifically looking at the cancer stem cell populations that give rise to glioblastoma, a, a, a highly malignant uh, brain cancer. So the whole concept for the entire data set is really this idea that glioblastomas arise from cancer stem cells. And it's this very rare minor population that actually give rise to the bulk. So the whole point of generating this data set was to take bulk tumors and the goal is to really find treatments that specifically target cancer stem cells. And the model that the, the data set uh, assumed going into the study was that current treatments, chemotherapy, debulk the tumor, but they leave behind these cancer stem cell populations. And it's these cancer stem cell populations that repopulate the bulk tumor and give rise to relapse. And the idea here is let's isolate the cancer stem cells, understand them, and come up with therapies to treat them. This ideal stem cell, cancer stem cell specific therapy will remove the cancer stem cells. And as a result, you'll see regression of the tumor, even if you're not actively targeting the bulk right off the bat. Um, so this data set is specifically a set of cultured glioblastoma stem cells. We have a primary GBM. You associate it just like you do for single cell sequencing. In this case, they culture it. Uh, the culture conditions select for brain tumor stem cells. And then these are then expanded into lasting cultures that can then be sequenced. And their entire research programs, in this case, Peter Dirk and Sam Weiss, uh, that uh, characterize these cancer stem cells using a, a variety of other functional assays. Uh, and this data set here is essentially looking at what transcriptional programs are active across a collection of glioblastoma stem cells. Uh, so the first question is relatively simple. Are brain tumor stem cells comprised of genetic and transcriptomic subpopulations? So are they homogeneous, like uh, cell lines were once thought to be? We now know they're not. Uh, or are they heterogeneous? Are there actually multiple populations within the uh, stem population? And is it possible to nominate a drug that is specific against one or uh, multiple clones? So this is the first plot. So the experiment here, the single cells have all been dissociated. In this case, they've all gone through the 10x genomics chromium platform. Uh, they've all been sequenced. They've gone through batch correction, uh, some level of normalization, uh, and have gone through the, uh, the long ranger, um, the long ranger pipeline. So Javier will teach you how to go from the fast cues to plots like these. Uh, these are Tisney plots, which are um, analogous to principal component um, plots. Uh, I'll go into a little more detail on this specifically in the workshop. Uh, and what I've colored here is essentially uh, cluster assignments for um, one by going through samples one by one for uh, distinct uh, transcriptional populations. And there's an algorithm here that essentially has a dial that lets you um, essentially resolve some of these uh, populations from one another. Uh, and I've ordered these basically by the number of clusters present in each uh, in each uh, GBM or glioblastoma stem cell population. Uh, at the top are the ones that are largely clonal, so essentially one or two clusters. Whenever there's two clusters, the second cluster is almost inevitably an actively cycling uh, cluster, and we see these in patient samples as well. Uh, there's always this hyperproliferative uh, malignant uh, population, and they score for cell cycle markers and pathways like K67. Uh, 
DNA synthesis, uh, these types of themes. Uh, and I've ordered these. So essentially, as you get later on the PowerPoint slide, you start to see additional clones until you get to this very biologically distinct uh, IDH mutant uh, glioblastoma, which has a large number of different uh, transcriptional uh, clusters. Uh, so this is really just the first, um, trying to answer that first question, are these highly heterogeneous? And the answer was, it depends. In general, there are not that many clones uh, coming out specifically in this GSC population, um, but there are some very uh, complex clonal structure present uh, in some of these lines. Uh, the other approach is really drawing on what we knew from uh, about glioblastoma. So in, from bulk DNA and RNA sequencing, we know that there are specific copy number alterations. Uh, you can also call out uh, very large arm or chromosome level changes from RNA sequencing data. And the way this works is looking not just at individual genes, but looking at whole cassettes of genes that exist on a chromosome arm or across the entire chromosome. And essentially, you're looking for that whole collection of genes to be over or underexpressed versus a baseline. Uh, and the key to calling large scale copy number alterations from RNA sequencing data is to have a high quality reference. Uh, this is extremely hard to do from bulk RNA sequencing data because you have so many different cell types contributing to that bulk. Uh, but with single cell sequencing data, you can actually take in each individual cancer or cancer cluster and normalize the gene expression values against their original cell of origin. Uh, so that was sort of the secret to getting this to work, is doing a genome-wide uh, inferred copy number analysis from the RNA using normal oligodendrocytes as the control. And this is really the key uh, to getting um, essentially a recapitulation of copy number variants we knew were there from RNA sequencing, but also be able to do a very deep dive on specific populations. So I've just zoomed in on one of those uh, Tisney plots here. Uh, you can see there's copy number alterations that absolutely every cluster has. So this gain of uh, seven is sort of a hallmark of, uh, uh, of glioblastoma. But you can see this subpopulation here marked in orange essentially had this loss of chromosome 10. This is thought to be targeted by P10, but you can see they're not in every single population. So already you can see just by eye the subclonal structure and you can play this game over and over. So there's this sub subclone, so this uh, chromosome 21 gain or chromosome 20 gain, and that's completely unique only to this population. Uh, I put in italics here the word partially because these copy number profiles are not explained completely by copy number variation. Uh, even within this clonal population, there are uh, specific subpopulations that are um, essentially not explainable purely by uh, their underlying copy number profiles. And you can play the sub-sub-clonal game over and over, like is this little loss of chromosome 6 a very important and unique subclone? Uh, it's not uniquely colored or called out as a subclone, uh, but this is really where the biological analysis and data exploration really comes in. Uh, suffice to say, it is possible to call uh, large-scale copy number variants from single-cell data not just at the bulk population level, but actually for each cluster individually. Uh, and Javier will tell you how to do this uh, in practice. So you'll be able to make a plot like this later on this afternoon. Uh, stepping back out a little bit, uh, across all the, what we're looking for is a magic bullet that would um, allow us to understand all of the glioblastoma stem cells together as a population. Uh, we did see that all patients' glioblastoma stem cells were different, but was there any sort of common biology that really brought them together? Uh, so this is the exact same concept. This is just yet another, in this case, it's a UMAP plot, which is sort of an updated version uh, of a Tisney plot. And you can see each patient is really clustering completely distinct. This is very, um, has been reported many times in many single cell uh, sequencing experiments. The malignant cell population, which these glioblastoma um, stem cells count, are all highly unique. They virtually never cluster together across different patients. Contrast that to the normal cells that we would see in a lot of these tumors that do intermix very strongly. So for example, if we took 50 uh, primary brain tumors, the normal cells will all intermix across multiple patients, but invariably each cancer or malignant population will form its own distinct group, very similar to what's shown on this plot here. Uh, you can see there is some relationship between two, uh, two spatially distinct tumors taken from the same patient. So whenever we had two lines from the same patient, uh, these were, closer to each other, or at least they're uh, more transcription related to one another, um, but they didn't sort of beautifully intermix like a normal T cell or immune cell population from them necessarily would be. Uh, analysis of this data essentially uncovered 
a gradient. So the uh, glioblastoma stem cells that expressed more developmental populations were at the top. Uh, and the second principal component was is these injury response uh, programs, uh, essentially these lines down here at the bottom. And if we score out those two specific programs, uh, we essentially showed that those two axes were mutually exclusive. So you, we basically scored out uh, the developmental score and an injury response score, and they were largely um, independent of one another. So if we take these two axes, injury response and developmental program, uh, essentially these lines are either heavily developmental, heavily injury response, or a mixture of, of these in between. We never saw a line that really populated both ends of the axes uh, simultaneously. Uh, these ones in the, middle are, in the middle are kind of on their way on the gradient, uh, but we never really saw one line that fully occupied uh, both ends of the, of the gradient. Uh, and this is really another way to look at that data, the exact same scores, but just looking at the distribution of cells across an individual GSC. And the, the take home message from this was really the need for multiple uh, samples to fully characterize these, uh, the, uh, the full spectrum of transcriptional states between this injury response and this developmental program. Uh, but this is really the power of using single cell sequencing because you get multiple measurements of similar biology and you really get nice distributions of these scores uh, across multiple samples. Uh, so keep in mind, we've been looking only at glioblastoma stem cells. Uh, the final question here was let's move into primary data. This is the other real power of single cell RNA sequencing data. So there's just an absolute ton of public data out there. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, Crescent towards the end of the, uh, the workshop, which is a data sharing program uh, to put all this public data into one computable uh, place. Uh, the take home from this slide is really the, uh, the two um, sort of the two ends of the gradient uncovered in glioblastoma stem cells are actually there to be found in primary patient tumors as well. They're just masked by this overall uh, bulk population as well. Uh, and this is really where single cell sequencing is so powerful because you can informatically pull out uh, the suspected glioblastoma stem cells from these primaries and then look at these um, injury or developmental scores uh, specifically in those populations. Uh, and this is the model where this paper really landed on, the idea that the glioblastoma stem cell populations within bulk tumors exist on this development to injury response uh, axis. And then these are essentially churning out the bulk tumor, and they're actually on an alternate axis or on this astrocytic um, developmental program. And I did caution early on about the dangers of using these trajectory uh, programs, but they really are actually quite informative, uh, as long as you're aware of some of the caveats and assumptions that the trajectory methods uh, have coming in. So specifically here, we have the glioblastoma stem cells existing on the uh, developmental to injury response uh, gradient, and then giving rise to these uh, mature astrocyte uh, bulk, uh, bulk tumor cells. Uh, and single cell sequencing really allowing you to score out and look at these signatures uh, on a cluster by cluster basis. Uh, and that's really where this project is and where a lot of the thinking around single cell sequencing has come. Certainly a lot of genomics, certainly when I was a trainee, was really around uh, binning. So really putting cancer, uh, cancer types or can uh, cancer specimens into subtypes. Um, classical proneural mesenchymal are sort of the bedrock of glioblastoma. The thinking is really starting to evolve with single cell sequencing as we see uh, cells really being anchored, especially by stem cell populations, and really being a, a feature of development gone awry. Uh, and really not trying to necessarily place a cell into a specific bucket, but trying to understand where they may be on developmental trajectories. Uh, and potentially you're starting to map the position on these gradients to specific uh, therapeutic uh, interventions, especially in glioblastoma where really treatments have not changed and certainly survival has not uh, improved um, very much at all uh, over the last decade. Uh, and this is also really where a lot of the bioinformatic analysis stemming from single cell work uh, land is really the need for secondary experiments. So it's really important to think about how are you gonna validate anything that you infer from your single cell data is it a functional screen? Is it a, a drug screen? Uh, where we got this project is trying to look at drug predictions at the cluster level. Um, but just like most genomic work, genomics in isolation really gives you leads or hypotheses to test, but you inevitably have to plan out that additional validation experiment uh, using orthogonal uh, technologies like proteomics or functional genomics approaches. 
I just want to finish off with some of the gaps and opportunities, certainly in research in cancer single cell genomics. Um, big one certainly is uh, single cell methods aware of aneuploidy. So a lot of these methods, especially the batch effects, are not do not take underlying copy number variation uh, into account. So some of these transcriptomes are extremely skewed but due to little hyperamplicons or deletions of, uh, of large chunks of DNA. Uh, large reference sets of single cell data from healthy tissue is extremely valuable, especially for answering questions around how um, normal cells inhabit or change or differentiate when they're within a tumor. Uh, and really where I th certainly see the field is going is uh, what does a clinical single cell sequencing uh, test going to look like? How do you interpret a profile? How do you make sense of multiple subclones um, from inferred copy number variation? And how do you really roll these up into a distilled report? Uh, that can be used to guide treatment of patients. Uh, one step towards that is infrastructure. So you're going to get to learn how to use Crescent today. This is essentially a cloud-based RNA sequencing, a single cell RNA sequencing uh, system. Uh, it takes raw data, so it allows you to keep your own data private, but also to share it with your, uh, your colleagues in a controlled way. Um, some of the heavy lifting is taken off of you. This is all done through a web browser. And then some uh, provided uh, dashboards for quality control, um, working with clusters, labeling clusters, providing uh, metadata, and then actually doing some analysis as well, differential gene expression, uh, and coming soon, uh, integration with, uh, with multiple public data sets. Uh, so I encourage you to poke around this system. There's many cells from many data sets. Uh, some of them are private, some of them are public. Um, so welcome you to join the uh, Crescent user group uh, and, to, and continue to interact through the Toronto Single Cell Expression Working Group. Uh, this data that I just showed that uh, you're going to be working with is also available in Crescent. So you can actually see that little GSC and bulk tumor uh, pattern in a web browser. You can type in your favorite gene uh, and explore it to your heart's content. So this is now publicly released. Uh, so not enough time to workshop, so this is still in the planning. Um, everything I've talked about is focused solely on the cancer cell population. Of course, there's a whole world of infiltrating cells uh, that inhabit tumors, uh, and this will, uh, exploring the tumor immune microenvironment is likely a topic uh, for another module. So I encourage you to sign up for that uh, when it's fully developed. Uh, so there's the paper if anyone needs it. If you'd like to join the Toronto Single Cell Working Group, Toronto's in quotes because it's grown far beyond the bounds of Toronto. It's pan, pan Canada uh, and actually quite actually has several international participants as well. So that's the site there. Uh, developers of Crescent uh, listed there. Uh, and if you want to make data, we offer this as a service through the Princess Margaret Genomic Center. The objectives of this hands-on part of the of the session today is that by the end of this lecture, you will understand the methods that are commonly used to analyze single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, you will be able to select parameters for your analysis and know how to use state-of-the-art tools um, to analyze your data. In particular, we're going to be using uh, data sets from glioblastoma from a paper that was recently published by Trevor's group. Um, I will give you the reference in the next slides. So the agenda for, for this uh, tutorial, uh, Trevor already gave you an overview about where the single cell analysis field is going. I have to say that this is a relatively new field, um, not more than seven years old compared with other, other fields in genomics. This is relatively new and it has had um, very good um, number of tools being developed. So um, uh, we try to select the best ones based on benchmark studies. We will speak about it. And those are the ones that we will cover today. Um, I will also speak about the motivations to automate single cell RNA-seq analysis. Give you a broad overview about how a typical single cell analysis pipeline looks. And then we will enter into the methods themselves, we will start with Cell Ranger, which is a proprietary uh, software developed by the company 10X, which is one of the technologies that Trevor mentioned in his talk, uh, the chromium technology. Um, it does essentially everything from taking the FASTQ files that the sequencing facility provide you, 
to um, map those reads against a reference transcriptome that you have to indicate. It can be mouse, human, and then we have single cell or single nuclei. We will, we will talk about that later. Um, this is a process that takes a while to run. It can take, even in a high performance computer, it can take a few days. So we will not run this today, but I will show you the, the results and how to interpret those results. In the modules that we have, sorry, in the lab that we have for this module, we will mainly focus on this part here, which is using a tool called Surat. Uh, it's developed by Raul Satija in New York and his group. And it does a second round of quality control checkout after Cell Ranger, uh, dimension reduction uh, using PCA or uh, RPCA, cell clustering, visualization using TSNEs and UMAP plots, and finally differential gene expression analysis. Um, a couple of other tools that I'm going to touch today are a uh, tool that we identified in a benchmark study as a top performer called GSBA. GSBA is used for many other purposes like pathway enrichment analysis that I think you will see tomorrow. And it's also used in the bulk RNA seq field, bulk RNA seq field. Um, essentially, you want to rank the expression of genes in this case that are characterizing a certain cluster and you want to label those clusters based on those uh, gene sets. And then uh, Trevor showed a heat map with the copy number variance for the glioblastoma data. And I will explain you how to use that tool and how to interpret the results. And finally, we will cover a tool that is being developed in, uh, uh, in our lab with Trevor. Um, is, is called Crescent. It stands for cancer single cell, um, cancer single cell expression uh, toolkit. It's a web app. It's made user friendly. It's for people who don't necessarily have computational biology background. So you don't have to install any software dependencies. You just need your raw data and then you can run the analysis there. Um, and again, the sample data that we will be using today is from glioblastoma from this paper. All right. So what's the motivation about doing single cell analysis in an automated, automated way? We have biological, technical, and I would say bioinformatic motivations for this. The biological motivation is pretty much what Trevor covered in his, in his talk. We have a lot of different cell types in the tumor microenvironment, and we want to characterize those differences between cell types and or cell stages. Um, in terms of technology, we have many different ways to measure single cell RNA-seq data. Trevor spoke about these two, SmartSeq2 and 10x chromium, but there are some others, and they produce different types of readouts. Uh, the normalization has to be different and of course, you want to have tools that can handle different types of measurements, normalize them, correct for batch effects, et cetera, so that you can have a better picture of the tumor microenvironment with different, with data from different labs or different studies. Um, these two plots that I'm showing here are meant to show uh, how the field has been growing in terms of data generation. 2015, studies were published in about a few dozen cells per study. And then from 2015, it started to grow exponentially. And now some studies are publishing up to 1 million cells being measured by single cell RNA seq technologies. This is still growing exponentially. Not only the number of cells that are being measured is growing, but also as a factor of the number of cells, we keep seeing more and more cell types and more cell clusters. And assuming that the same clusters are representatives or of, of specific cell types or cell stages, then this is telling us that we still need to do way more sequencing to understand a more complete picture about cancer and the tumor microenvironment. Because we have all this wealth of information, data from single cell, we need powerful uh, tools that can handle all this, all this data. This number 
is um, I, I took it from this uh, GitHub repository where the community is curating um, computational tools that are being developed. So if you develop a new tool for single cell RNA sequencing, you can go here and ask the coordinators to index it there so that the community have a control about who is doing what and maybe avoid redundancy in terms of computational tools. This is, I think, for like at least one year old. So it's probably around three or 400 computational tools that are out there now, just in this repository. Um, in Bioconductor, um, this passed from uh, two tools in 2016 to 15, 2019, and there are about 100 uh, these days, just in Bioconductor. So that tells you uh, uh, about how hot is this area nowadays, but also for a um, computational biologist or data scientist in general, sometimes having so many tools can be challenging because you don't know which tool you should use. Uh, if you see a nice paper, they use a tool. Uh, they, you see another paper, they use another tool. And then it becomes a little confusing which tools you should use. And I will tell you the, the approach that we're taking in Crescent to address this wealth of data and computational tools been available. So that's exactly what I'm trying to summarize in this slide. This is a typical single cell RNA-seq analysis pipeline. It has nine steps, but they are not linear. Sometimes you do the QC and then you go to the clustering and then you go back to the QC. I just listen, listening, um, listing the steps here for the purpose of uh, illustration, but sometimes it's a process that goes back, goes back and forth. Um, the mapping, uh, if you are working with 10X data from Chromium technologies, you will use Cell Reindeer. There is no need for using anything else because this software uh, is free to use, uh, is very well maintained. It has uh, various releases during the year. And I have to say that they have a phenomenal technical support in 10X. Um, so if you're working with 10X Chromium uh, technologies, uh, you go straight to Cell Reindeer. The only thing that you have to take care of in this case is the reference transcriptome. If your samples come from human, come from mouse, you have to use the corresponding uh, reference transcriptome or genome. And also you have to take care if it's in human, if it's the HG19 version or GC38, GRC38 etc. So try to keep your things consistent. That's very important uh, at, the, at the lab level, at least that all your students or your postdocs are hopefully using the same genome version so that the data is comparable. Um, the other thing that you have to take care when you're using Cell Ranger is um, in the single cell uh, field, um, sometimes in, and more in, on cancer samples or uh, samples that come from a certain disease, from a biopsy, et cetera. The samples cannot be processed right away in the lab. So sometimes they have to be frozen down and then stored uh, uh, in, in the cold temperature and then processed afterwards. And one way to handle those types of samples is um, measuring the expression of genes within the nuclei rather than the whole cell. So we call that single nuclei instead of single cell it will be SN, single nuclei, RNA-seq. Because they come from the nuclei, uh, the transcripts there don't, don't have splicing yet. So the reference transcriptome that has to be used for Cell Ranger has to be indexed in that way. That still doesn't have um, splicing. That's, that's one point that you have to take care when, cell when you run Cell Ranger. Now, in most of the cases, um, at least in Princess Margaret, um, in the Princess Margaret Hospital or UHN, um, Cell Ranger is run by the sequencing facility um, and the computational facility at UHN. Um, so you will indicate then which reference transcriptome, reference transcriptome you want to use. Okay, so now once you have your, your reads mapped to a given genome, you will have a matrix. Let me see if I have. Um, I have a slide here. Yeah, you will have a matrix like this one. It's called an MTX format. It has three files, 
and it's nothing else but one file that has the barcodes that identify each of the cells. So each of these DNA sequences is unique and represents one cell in the sample. And then you have a second file that is called features. In all the versions of Cell Ranger, it was called genes.tsv. Um, but the features are for single cell RNA seq are genes. That's that's pretty much. What happens is that there are technologies, as was brought uh, during the last part of Trevor's presentation. There are other types of measurements like uh, methylation, etc., where the features might not be genes; they might be chromosomal regions. So the the, the file is called features, and in the case of single cell RNA seq, they are genes. So imagine that these barcodes are in a matrix are your rows, or actually the other way. Your barcodes are the columns, are the feature, and the features or the genes are the rows. And then we have a third file, which is called uh, the proper MTX file, which has this format. You have the number of features, meaning genes in that, in that particular sample, the number of barcodes, meaning cells that were identified, and then the number of measurements, the number of time points in your matrix. And then you have uh, three columns. You have the column indicating the feature index, which is the number 10 in this, in this file, um, and then the number of the, uh, of, of the barcode index, which is the number one here, and so on. And then here you have the number of times, the number of UMIs or number of reads, that this particular gene was measured in this particular cell. So in this case, it was measured only once, sometimes it's twice, and so on. You can have hundreds depending on, on the cell and the, and the gene. Why do we have this format? The, the main reason is because when you have big matrices, for example, in a single sample, you can have uh, five to 10,000 cells, let's say 5,000 cells, and you have about 30,000 uh, genes. So you will have a matrix of 30,000 rows by 5,000 columns. Now think about a typical single cell RNA seq study. You will have probably about 50 data sets and then you will, sorry, 50 samples from multiple patients, multiple conditions. So when you integrate those matrices of thousands by thousands, you might end up having a matrix that is just not being able to be loaded um, or it will take a lot of space. And the most important point that I haven't mentioned is that about 90% of that matrix will be empty, meaning will be zeros. Those are cases where a given gene was not detected at all in a given cell. So that, that's a waste of hard drive space. To avoid having zeros, the matrix MTX format will have only um, uh, indices for cases where the, the gene was measured, where the gene was measured in the cell at least once. All the zeros are, are not included. Okay, so that's, that's the output of Cell Ranger. Um, during today's uh, labs, we will cover uh, the rest of the steps here. I have to, tell you that some of these steps are very memory intensive and uh, hopefully we can run them all. But if not, I'm, I will to share with you uh, the GitHub where I have all the documentation. And I also loaded into Zenodo, a repository, the intermediate files so that we can run them smoothly uh, today's labs. Okay, so the second step is called, uh, is a quality control checkout. Cell Ranger has its own quality control that we are going to see in, in the next minutes. Or actually, I should probably go over it now. Uh, let me go back to my browser. This is another sample where you can see that that slope is not as pronounced as in the first one. In the first one, it was more like this, whereas here is more um, the slope is, 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 is smaller, right? That means that you have fewer cells with a high content of, of RNA, and probably some of these 
uh, barcodes that are called cells, they were actually ambient RNA. You just have to be careful with that. And 10X will actually give you some warnings in the, in the output. It's telling us here that there was a low fraction of reads in cells, which is exactly what we're seeing here. We have, ideally, they will ask you to have at least 70% of the reads to be within this region in blue. If it's less than 70%, they will send you this warning. And I think if it's less than 30% or something, this warning will be in red and it will be an error rather than a warning. So this is kind of a, the first quality control checkout that you want to do as soon as you get your data back from the sequencing facility. Other types of warnings that you might see are related, for example, to the number of reads. If this is too low, it might be that the indices at the sequencing facility uh, were, didn't work out as were expected. Maybe there is a mismatch of the indices, et cetera. Um, one common warning that you might have is a low fraction of reads mapped to the reference transcriptome or to the genome. So here, for example, we have about 95%. 95% of all the reads mapped to the genome, which is good. It's a very good number. If you have less than 70%, you will have a warning. And I think less than 50%, you will have an error. And that typically means that the reference transcriptome that was used for this analysis was incorrect. Perhaps you have a human sample and the reference transcriptome used was a mouse genome or you use a single cell, um, single cell data and the reference transcriptome was single nuclei. So you have a lot of um, uh, issues with the splicing there. Um, other things that you have to, of course, take care of uh, is the type of chemistry um, because 10X has been releasing different versions of the experimental kit. This is just something to have in mind. The newer, newer versions of the chemistry have more, more genes and more reads per, per cell. So if you're using version one, it's okay that these numbers are in general lower than version two. And then finally, you also want to keep in mind which version of Cell Ranger you're using. I think there is version five now, but um, the main difference was between Cell Ranger version two and version three. Uh, between those two versions, there was a big improvement in the algorithm that detects, um, uh, that distinguishes what is background from what is cells. So if you have a sample that was mapped with Cell Ranger version two, I would strongly recommend that you run it again. And actually when you are doing, uh, I mean, you run it again with a newer version uh, of Cell Ranger. And actually I will strongly recommend that whenever you are starting a new project, if you're getting samples from different labs, you're getting samples from public available repositories, and then you want to add your own samples, if you have access to the FASTQ files, I strongly recommend that you run Cell Ranger from scratch. Um, it's just computational time, but it will save you a lot of um, time afterwards in the analysis, because at least in this case, you will have exactly the same, the same genome annotations. You will have the exact same number of, of, uh, of genes being measured, etc. We can talk a little bit later about it's not easy to get FASTQ files always from public available um, or data that is supposed to be public available. Sometimes it's not that public, to be honest. But if you had access to the FASTQ files, I will recommend that you always run Cell Ranger. Um, okay, let me go back now to the slides. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, if not, we can, we can come back later always. All right, so we are in step one. Step two, um, these steps will go, I will go faster because we will see them uh, uh, live with the, with the labs. So the, the step two is QC. Uh, here we want to see if there are many uh, transcripts belonging to mitochondrial genes, which is usually an indicator that when the sample was processed in the lab, uh, there were many cells that were dying. 
when the cells um, uh, uh, are dying, often they start to express a lot of mitochondrial genes just as a general stress response. So if you have a lot of mitochondrial genes in your cells or in your sample, chances that that sample was, um, the cells in that sample were dying are higher. And so maybe you don't want to consider that sample because then you are not seeing at the biology of interest, you are just seeing a general stress response. You don't want that. Then once you have these two quality control steps, you do normalization of the samples. I will tell you more about it, essentially, to factor for- Sorry, Jeff, you have a quick question. Yes. So cells dying, is that a more common thing in cancer cell sort of, or just like just RNA single I cell? I think it's just common with the way the samples sometimes are processed. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's more common in cancer than in other, in other types okay. of tissues, but, or in other types of um, samples. Mm -hmm. But but certainly the way some cancer samples are processed are more prone to damage the cells. I know, for example, uh, liver tissue from cancer. The liver is very very uh, how to say is very prone to uh, the cells to start dying. So it's that more fragile. Yeah. Okay. So that can yeah. become damaged very easily. I don't know if Trevor is in yeah. That one. I think one nasty artifact is uh, ambient RNA from necrotic tissues, where you essentially just have yeah. RNA floating around and it gets encapsulated in the uh, droplet on a 10x platform. Sure, sure. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily higher than in cancer versus others, but definitely highly necrotic tissues. You could expect a higher ambient RNA level. Um, but yeah, I don't sure. know. I don't think anyone's really done like the systematic cancer versus non-cancer comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great, yeah. Thank, thanks guys. No worries. The good thing with single cell technologies is that computationally, you can try to identify groups of cells that presumably were dying and separate them from the rest. So there are, I mean, compared with bulk rna -seq, for example, where you have everything in a mixture and you cannot decomposite that very easily. We can, we can talk about that uh, during the, tutorial. Um, then you do normalization. Here we are essentially trying to correct for uh, sequencing depth. Some samples might have been sequenced deeper than others and we want to control for that. Then we do something called batch effect correction. We will spend most of the time during the, during the tutorial um, uh, going over batch effect correction. And this is for example, when Two samples come from different labs. They were prepared by different people or uh, even using different technologies, uh, 10X chromium versus SQL, et cetera. So we try to correct for technical artifacts that will otherwise mislead the biological assumptions that we're making. The fifth step, uh, once we correct for those batch effects, we integrate all the samples into one big matrix and then we do, because we will have a very high dimensional matrix of thousands of genes by hundreds of thousands of cells, um, doing analysis with that big matrix will take forever. So we need to reduce the dimension. And typically here we use something like PCA or RPCA. We will see it in, in, in the tutorial. Then with the, with the dimensions being reduced, we cluster the cells just with the features, meaning the genes that were more informative. What I mean for, by that is we want to keep the genes that were well measured in many cells, right? We want to remove genes that are poorly measured in most of the cells, but also we want to know that they are just housekeeping genes, that they are expressed always in all the cells because that, that also don't tell us any information. We want genes that are well measured, but that, but that, that at the same time, at the same time, they are having changes in, in the samples and in the cells. So with those genes, um, we will do the cell clustering uh, by comparing the, the gene expression profile of the cells uh, with this dimension reduction. And then here we do um, uh, differential gene expression. We want to see if uh, 
group of cells is expressing, what genes are different, differentially expressed in another group of cells, et cetera. Um, and then uh, as a data scientist, you want to show this to your audience, which can be your paper readers, can be your collaborators. So you want to put all those tables and those um, um, analysis in a nice way using visualization tools like the UMAP plot, heat maps, et cetera, that we're going to see today. And also cell cluster labeling. So instead of telling your collaborators, I have 10 clusters, you can tell I have five cell types which are split into 10 clusters, something like that. So in Crescent, just uh, quickly, uh, the way we are selecting some of these algorithms or methods to do each of these steps we is, is, is that we rely on um, benchmark studies, either done by others or by ourselves. And we pick the top performers and that's what we implement in, in, in Crescent. Okay. Um, this is the data that Trevor was showing in his talk um, from Laura um, and others, uh, Trevor's lab. And in particular, in, uh, in the tutorial today, we are going to focus on these seven um, samples or are from glioblastoma. But you can see that they have different um, number of cells. They have different types of cells. Um, for example, these are all malignant cells from all these seven samples. Um, so I thought it was a very nice um, example to work with today. Hopefully we can run all seven. Actually, I know that we will remove at least one uh, because of computational limitations in some of the steps, but hopefully we can work with the remaining six. If not, we will just work with uh, three of them or so. And then once you have time um, and more computational power, you can essentially copy the same code and run all seven or more, or more samples from this paper. We have all the data from this paper in Crescent and I will tell you how to get it. 